Hello, family. My name is David. I'm a great recovering addict. All right. Ow! All right. Welcome to the Georgia Regional Convention of Narcotics Anonymous 42. Happy, joyous, and free an inside job. All right. Maybe we didn't get that cue right. All right. Welcome to Grigna 42. Happy, joyous, and free. Free and inside job. All right, let's open this meeting with a moment of silence, followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Our intention for this convention is to make available to our fellowship a weekend of recovery, celebration, and fun. We hope that all addicts receive the NA message of recovery while they are participating in this event. It is our hope that the message we carry may truly let everyone know that NA is a place to recover and that no addict need die from addiction. We've asked some volunteers, and these volunteers are people who are on the committee. Uh, tonight, we are doing the vice chairs and alternate chairs of certain uh, subcommittees. Uh, we've asked Harris R. to come up and uh, give the, who is an addict? Hey, everybody. Yeah. My name is Harris, and I am an addict. Yeah. I'm a little nervous because this is my first time running in front of everybody. I mean, bunch of people. Yeah. Um, I'm grateful to be here. Grateful to be clean today. And I am re I'm ready to read who is an addict. Most of us do not have to think about this question we know. Our whole life and thinking was centered in drugs in one form or another. The getting and using and finding ways and means to get more. We live to use and use to live. Very simply, an addict is a man and woman whose life is controlled by drugs. We are people in the grip of a continuing and progressive illness whose ends are always the same, jails, institutions, and death. All right, he's a volunteer serenity keeper. All right, next we have Josh J. He's our BOD vice chair. Which one of these are, which one of these are working? Hi, my name is Josh, I'm an addict. That's nice, that energy. Uh, this is what is the Narcotics Anonymous program. NA is a nonprofit fellowship or society of men and women for whom drugs had become a major problem. We are recovering addicts who meet regularly to help each other stay clean. This is a program of complete abstinence from all drugs. There is only one requirement for membership, the desire to stop using. We suggest that you keep an open mind and give yourself a break. Our program is a set of principles written so simply that we can follow them in our daily lives. The most important thing about them is that they work. There are no strings attached to NA. We are not affiliated with any other organization. We have no initiation fees or dues, no pledges to sign, <laughs> no promises to make to anyone. Woo! Y'all ready. We are not connected with any political, religious, or law enforcement groups and are under no surveillance at any time. Anyone may join us regardless of age, race, sexual identity, creed, religion, or lack of religion. We are not interested in what or how much you used or who your connections were, what you've done in the past, how much or how little you have, but only in what you want to do about your problem and how we can help. The newcomer is the most important person at any meeting because we can only keep what we have by giving it away. We have learned from our group experience that those who keep coming to our meetings regularly stay clean. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Brandon P. He's our tech vice chair. Addict name, Brandon. Hey, everybody. Why are we here? Before coming to the Fellowship of NA, we could not manage our own lives. We could not live and enjoy life as other people do. We had to have something different, and we thought we had found it in drugs. We placed their use ahead of the welfare of our families, our wives, husbands, and our children. We had to have drugs at all costs. We did many people great harm, but most of all, we harmed ourselves. Through our inability to accept personal responsibilities, we were actually creating our own problems. 
We seem to be incapable of facing life upon its own terms. Most of us realize that in our addiction, we were slowly committing suicide. But addiction is such a cunning enemy of life that we had lost the power to do anything about it. Many of us ended up in jail or sought help through medicine, religion, and psychiatry. None of these methods was sufficient for us. Our disease always resurfaced or continued to progress until in desperation, we sought help from each other in Narcotics Anonymous. After coming to NA, we realized we were sick people. We suffered from a disease from which, we, from which there is no known cure. It can, however, be arrested at some point and recovery is impossible. I love this energy tonight. Thank you guys. Yeah! Woo! Yeah! All right, next we have Jennifer P and she is our registration chair. You might have seen her up there at that table when you came in today. Hey, I'm Jennifer and I'm an addict. Hey. I was a little nervous coming up here, but gosh, y'all are showing me some love. <laughs> All right, I love y'all. Um, so how it works, if you want what we have to offer and are willing to make the effort to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. These are the principles that made our recovery possible. One, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, we humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, we made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, we continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to addicts and to practice these principles in all our affairs. This sounds like a big order and we can't, can't do it all at once. We didn't become addicted in one day, so remember, yeah. there is one thing more than anything else that will defeat us in our recovery. This is an attitude of indifference or intolerance towards spiritual principles. Three of these that are indispensable are honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. With these, we are well on our way. We feel that our approach to the disease of addiction is completely realistic for the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel. We feel that our way is practical for one addict can un best understand and help another addict. We believe that the sooner we face our problems within our society and everyday living, just that much faster do we become acceptable, responsible, and productive members of that society. The only way to keep from returning to active addiction is not to take that first drug. If you're like us, you know that one is too many. <laughs> All right, for we, uh, we put great emphasis on this. For we know that when we use drugs in any form or substitute one for another, we release our addiction all over again. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Thinking of alcohol as different from other drugs has caused a great many addicts to relapse. Before we came to NA, many of us viewed alcohol separately but we cannot afford to be confused about this. Oh. Period. <laughs> we are people with the disease of addiction who must abstain from all drugs in order to recover. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, next we have Candace Kay. She is our alternate treasurer this year. <laughs> Miss Moneybags, if you will. What's up? I'm Candace and I'm an addict. Hey. These are the 12 traditions of NA. We keep what we have only with vigilance, and just as the freedom from the individual comes from the 12 steps, so the freedom from the group springs from our traditions. As long as the ties that bind us together are stronger than those that would tear us apart, all will be well. Number one, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends on NA unity. Number two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants they do not govern. Number three, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop using. Number four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or NA as a whole. Number five, each group has but one primary purpose to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. Number six, an NA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the NA group to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, or prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Number seven, 
Every NA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Number eight, Narcotics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Number nine, NA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Number 10, Narcotics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the NA name, NA name not, ought never be drawn into public controversy. Number 11, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. Number 12, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all of our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Understanding these traditions comes slowly over a period of time. We pick up information as we talk to members and visit various groups. It is usually, it usually isn't until we get involved with service that someone points out that personal recovery depends on NA unity, and that unity depends on how well we follow our traditions. The 12 traditions of NA are not negotiable. They are the guidelines that keep our fellowship alive and free. By following these guidelines in our dealings with others and society at large, we avoid many problems. That's not to say that our traditions eliminate all problems. We still have to face difficulties as they arise, communication problems, differences of opinion, internal controversies and tr troubles with individuals and groups outside the fellowship. However, when we apply these principles, we avoid some of the pitfalls. Many of our problems are like those that our predecessors had to face. Their hard won experience gave birth to the, to the traditions and our own experience has shown that these principles are just as valid today as they were when these traditions were formulated. Our traditions protect us from the internal and external forces that could destroy us. They are truly the ties that bind us together. It is only through understanding application that they work. They work. Thank you, Candace. Can you hear me now? All right. Uh, next, we have Felicia, Felicia C., our activities vice chair. There's a lot of folks in here. Hi, my name is Felicia, and I'm an addict. Just for today, just for today, tell yourself. Just for today, my thoughts will be on my recovery, living and enjoying life without the use of drugs. Just Oh, y'all got me messed up. Just for today, I will have faith in someone in NA who believes in me and wants to help me in my recovery. Thanks. Just for today, I will have a program. I will try to follow it to the best of my ability. Just for today, through NA, I will try to get a better perspective on my life. Just for today, I will be unafraid. My thoughts will be on my new associations, people who are not using it, those who have found a new way of life. So as long as I follow that way, I have nothing to fear. Here, here. All right, and last but certainly not least, we have Trip S, who is our programming vice chair. Thank you. Woo. Uh, Trip addict. Um, I, we do recover. When at the end of the road, we find that we can no longer function as human beings, either with or without drugs, we all face the same dilemma. What is it left to do? There seems to be this alternative. Either go to the best we can, oh, to go on as best we can to the bitter ends, jails, institutions, and death, or find a new way to live. In the years gone by, very few addicts ever had this last choice. Those who are addicted today are more fortunate. For the first time in man's entire history, a simple way has been proven itself in the lives of many addicts. It is available to all of us. This is a simple, spiritual, not religious program known as Narcotics Anonymous. <laughs> Again, my name is David. I'm a great recovering addict. And I am your convention vice chair. Thank you. I wish I wish every day at work would happen like that. You know, I just walk in and I get applause. Um, I do want to kind of switch things up. I know we're supposed to do some announcements at the end, but I think some of these are going to be important to go over now before we get to the uh, focus of tonight. Um, number one is our press release statement. As our 11th tradition says, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. 
The primary purpose of our public relations effort is to tell the story of Narcotics Anonymous and what our program offers to the still suffering addicts. Members of the press are often attracted by uh, to our conventions and events, and we are well and we welcome their interest. However, we do not disclose our last names in the media as identifiable members of Narcotics Anonymous. If members of the press approach you, please direct them to the board of directors or the CPP planning panel, the convention planning panel. Thank you. All right, that's out of the way. Uh, another announcement, uh, please respect the facility. Uh, they have put, put smoking signs out uh, where, where we can smoke. Uh, vaping inside the building is not permitted. Uh, so please be respectful of the, uh, the site. They let us come in and, and have this. So the, the least we can do is respect their rules. Uh, I know this, this room is a little hard it's kind of off the beaten path we do have some directional signs but this is grand hall seven anytime your program says grand hall this is the room that that's talking about just so you know all right uh and last but not least we have raffle tickets for sale and look we got the if you want to see what we're raffling off there is a table set up in merchandise uh with with the items that we're raffling off uh, you can see Bobby Joe, who is raising her hand right now. Candace, John K. We got Don over here, who's been manning the merchandise room. Um, the, you can get uh, tickets through any of them. All right. All right. Let's get into it. All right. I'm gonna introduce tonight's. Uh, I'm introducing it to the introducer. <laughs> uh, Vanessa is gonna introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Hello, family. My name is Vanessa, and I, I am a grateful recovering addict. Hey, I can't say enough about her. You know, um, I have the pleasure of, of, of taking her through the steps and sponsoring her. And um, y'all know they say it's a two-way street, so sometimes she sponsors me. Um, I can't say enough about unique. You know, um, <clears throat> unique is a a person that does what the program all asks us to do. She do step work. She call me on a regular basis. She sponsor women. She go many miles to carry the message, right? She don't mind helping newcomers, right? And she ain't biased, right? She don't care. Red, blue, green, orange, you know, she gonna, if she got some resources, she can come, come. She, can. she just learned how to trying to separate this stuff because, you know, you need to jump in her car and go try to rescue. She learned how to stop trying to rescue people and give people, let people, you know, find their way. And um, and that's been hard for her. But without further ado, I give y'all my baby, Unique. <laughs> Care to miss you, baby, have fun. Ooh, we. Ooh, we. Hey, family, I'm Unique and I'm an addict. <laughs> Thank God for step work. I just moved it the way I wanted it now. She just like, thank God for step work. Y'all can hear me better now. Got right, my tissue because I might be a mess in a minute. So, um, but I was saying thank God for step work because for the first time in my life, and I'm I'm speaking, um, I typically fall apart. like falling apart, you know, anxious and nervous. And by the grace of God, I don't feel that way today. But I am nervous. Right? I am nervous. But as my predecessors say, I'd rather be nervous than paranoid. <laughs> so let's get into it. First of all, I want to thank Gretna for allowing me the opportunity to carry the message of Narcotics Anonymous, right? And I also want to thank the committee, you know, for being intentional and recognizing that diversity is our strength, right? And I want to thank everybody that showed up to see Unique D tonight, right? It's some people that drove some miles to come and support me today. And um, so 
So I have family that I never met. Mm -hmm. And um, now I'm about I called my uncle that I know lives here in Athens that I've only met once. And I said, Uncle Jesse, I'm going to be in Athens speaking. He's right there on the front row. Yeah. He's 90 years old, baby. Show him what that 90 look like, baby. 90 years old, man. I'm trying to be like that. I'm glad I seen that side of the family. I'm trying to be like that. You hear me? Woo wee. So I want to welcome a newcomer, right? You know, the story you thought was over is just beginning. It's just beginning, right? And um, if you have a, a year or less, can you please stand? Yeah. Welcome to Narcotics Anonymous. Welcome to Narcotics Anonymous. And um, man, I'm so grateful to be here, man. So another another thing I wanted to add, like if you got one to twenty nine years, please stand. One to twenty nine. One to twenty nine. Right. Right. All right. So the ones that stood up for a year, them your cousins. All right, them your cousins. All right. So if you got thirty years or more. Please stand. And those are your aunties and your uncles, all right? Not also known as dinosaurs. Yeah. All right. You know, I'm real grateful for Narcotics Anonymous, man. I um, I truly feel secure in the love of the fellowship, man. I love y'all. Because when I walked in this room alone, um, I'm a motherless and fatherless child. And when I came to Narcotics Anonymous, I cussed everybody out. Oh, I, I'm trying to... I'm getting better, so I'm trying to be intentional with my language. But y'all, if y'all was there, you would know. Um, it's actually a lady. Um, I remember I had three days clean. And um, I, I went to this group, and, and, and it was only men in that group. And they called this woman and told them that was, it was this girl in this meeting. She needs to see you. She came to me. She said, are you OK? I said, I'm good. She said, are you really okay? I said, bitch, I said I'm good. <laughs> she drove all the way down here to see me too. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, we the board. They tell you to keep coming, man. You should keep coming. Some of that stuff just fall off. I already gave my uncle the disclaimer. He don't know me. He is about to. <laughs> Ah, oh, so our message is that an addict, any addict, can stop using drugs, lose the desire to use, and find a new way to live. The message is hope, and the promise is freedom. And when it's all said and done, our primary purpose is to carry the message to the addict who still suffers, because that's all we have to give. Right. So you cannot leave here tonight and say you do not hear the message. That's the message. All I have is my experience, strength, and hope. That's it, right? That's all I have, right? So, <laughs> man, <clears throat> you know, when the humor is in it, you'd be all right. But when it's time to get down to the, the, <laughs> to the nitty gritty, all right. So I asked, um, let me say this. I, um, had the opportunity of like helping Gretna for the past like three or two, two or three years behind the scenes to get speakers. So I'll send out 
audios from different conventions and stuff I traveled to. So I was working very close with Tiffany. And um, so she called me August 23rd. And she says, would you like to be the main speaker? I'm like, what? And I've been having, I've been feeling like I had to shit ever since then. I've been, I've been a nervous wreck, y'all. I've been rehearsing and 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 just I this I ain't never did this one before. This is new. This is new, you know, because my disease wants to silence me. My disease wants me to believe that I don't have a message to carry. My disease wants me to compare myself to every other speaker I've stayed, seen stand at this podium. You know, it wants to tell me, you know, everybody that get up here is supposed to have double digits and all of this, you know, misinformed information. You know what I'm saying? But obviously I have a message to carry and that's what I came here to do tonight. All right. <clears throat> so, um, as I stated, you know, I lost lost both of my parents to the disease of addiction. Um, I'm not gonna really go back too far because um, we already know what that was like, but I can um, say that, you know, I dropped out of school. I got into prostitution and uh, drug addiction very early. I was constantly running away from home and um, I was constantly going to institutions. Um, I've been in all types of institutions. It's funny, like I'm studying social work and I just have all the, the stories to go with all that shit we talking about. Like, oh, I was in a wilderness camp when I was 15 years old for a whole year. Oh, I was a runaway. You know, I was a fucking committed to the state. Uh, you know, I was, you know what I'm saying? All of that stuff, but that's how God will use you, right? Like I understand today that all my, uh, all my liabilities have become assets for me today, right? And I'm so grateful for that. You know, but I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. ATL, baby, ATL, ATL, ATL. You know, I was born in Atlanta. And um, as I said, most of my parents were on drugs. I grew up on that west side of Atlanta. Um, yeah, you know, and I had a grandmother. You know, thank God for loving and praying and caring grandmothers, man. I'm so grateful for my grandmother, man. Like she, it was nothing I could do. She never gave up on me, right? I mean, she might've cut me off, but she didn't give up on me. She told me I'm gonna have life insurance to bury your dead ass. <laughs> I was a mess. I was, I was driving my grandmother crazy, you hear me? But needless to say, you know, I'm gonna talk about how I was introduced to the program, right? So like, you know, it was a period of time where I was facing seven years in prison for some stuff I didn't, I mean, I did it, but I was coerced into doing it, you know what I'm saying? I was facing seven years in prison. I owed my lawyers $1,700. My car note was due, my rent due, was out, all, everything was due. And I was contemplating suicide. I was contemplating suicide, but I did not have the courage to kill my damn self. So I got out of the car, went to the park, because I wanted to drive my car in the lake. I was like, that's gonna take too long. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that's gonna take too long. I'm gonna, I'm gonna suffer, I don't want that. <laughs> You know, so I, I got out of the car and, and I went and sat on this park bench and, you know, I was doing drugs and, um, you know, this older white gentleman comes walking his dog and um, he said, are you okay? And I was like, no, I just broke down crying, telling them all my stuff that I needed paid, thinking it, I was really hoping it'd be like some pretty woman shit. I was really... <laughs> Really, really hoping he was gonna take care of all my debts and get me, get me on a clear path. You know, I thought I was, I, I, I was really hoping that was it. But he told me, he said, "Well, baby, I don't have no money, but I know a place you can go." And it ended up being a twelve-step meeting, and it was the other fellowship. 
And I remember sitting in it, because I'm thinking about all this aggression I used to have towards people that didn't look like me. But when I think about the people that really genuinely saved my life, they did not look like me. The old white way I'm walking that dog did not look like me. And then when I finally got to the meeting, it was a, it's, it's, it's a Clarkston meeting and they have like 300 chairs in there. And this woman come and sit, this white older woman come sit right next to me. I'm like, what the fuck? And, and it was only like seven of us in there. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, what are you? And in the end, she, she took me and she, and she held me hostage for a minute and told me her story and she told me the whole lot. Like she knew I was new. I was new. And she, and she told me, just don't drink. That's it. <laughs> I don't laugh a whole lot that anyway. <laughs> You know, I, this is before I was introduced to the disease of addiction that I've learned here in Narcotics Anonymous, right? So needless to say, I went in and out, in and out, in and out. And then eventually I decided to, um, I decided to, uh, to come back. And I would like to tell you that I was able to put together two years and two weeks, right? See, I understand today what it means to have clean time with no recovery. Right, because it says recovery through our 12 steps is our goal. You could collect days and not work now steps. Make now meetings, sponsor now person, you know, join now home group. You know, you don't have to do this to collect days, right? But like recovery through our 12 steps is our goal, right? So I remember being here those two years and two weeks and I just wanted my stuff back. And in the beginning, I was desperate. I, I, you know, I had, like I said, all my, you know, again, all my stuff was due again, you know, that unmanageability, you know, I, all my stuff was due. And, and, and honestly, I was, I was really, I really wanted to get out of the lifestyle I was living. I was tired of selling my body and stuff like that. And once I got to like, um, well, you know, I found a girlfriend when I had like 30 days. Right? She had about five years. I'm just going to suck her, recover up out of her and stay clean. You know, that's what I thought. You know what I'm saying? That's what I thought, right? Until we broke up. Until we broke up, right? So we broke up, right? And they tell us in our literature that we result back to our sickest behaviors, right? They tell us in recovery and relapse. It says here that... um. We may begin to ourselves, we become sick of ourselves in a short time. We revert back to our sickest behavior, sickest behavior patterns without even having to use drugs. So that's what happened. And then after that, y'all know what happened. I lost my clean time, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I understand today that clean time, is, you know, Granted, you can't have one without the other, but needless to say, I understand what it means when they talk about clean time not having and not having a recovery. So this time I came back, um, God sent another angel and asked me, was I okay? And again, I had a hysterical fit. No, I'm not okay. And needless to say, the first thing that popped in my mind was a friend of mine the night before who would not buy me a drink in the club. Because when he met me, I had my little two years at the time. And I, the first thing, I was like, damn, I got to go back to these meetings with these old ass people. Because I don't know about your area, but in my area, everybody got more clean time than I've been born. Everybody. It, it ain't nothing to see somebody with 35. You think 35 right there, 35. You got 35 today, right? 35. <laughs> 35. <laughs> right. All right. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, they, they all like that. And they slip, too. You got to watch out for them, too. You know, they <laughs> you know but, you know, I, I remember that being my first thought. Like, damn, I got to go back to these, to these meetings, man. And, and I really did not want to come back. And I remember being so angry and upset about having to come back to Narcotics Anonymous. 
And that's the reason why I continue to cuss and fuss the way that I did. <laughs> oh, I used to say some nasty. I'm gonna just give y'all one of them. My favorite one was y'all was a bunch of fucking crackheads in here trying to raise me and y'all ain't even raise your own kids. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was brutal. You hear me? I was brutal. I, I was so mean. You know, but that's before I began to start talking about the loss of my parents. Nobody had never knew that. All I saw was somebody trying to tell me what to do. So needless to say, when I came back, my clean date is June 15, 2016. We have seven years, eight months, and eight days. And uh, my clean date is also the same day that my friend OD for the people that's walking out. <laughs> it's okay. Keep coming back, baby. Keep coming back. It's all good. You know, uh, somebody told me that too. He was like, people gonna be walking out. I was like, shit, I walk out too. I walk out all the time. Shit, if I ain't connecting, then it just is just what it is. You know, uh, don't never beat the walk away doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but needless to say, you know, my, my clean date is the same day that my friend OD. And God set it up to where she actually OD um, after I picked up my key tag. And my argument was always I was too young to get clean. But God showed me I wasn't too young to die. Right. And I remember being so angry that I needed, that, that I had to be in the meeting. And I'm not realizing the grace that God had put on my life. I'm not realizing, you know, all I wanted was my mama and daddy back. But then the reality is, he put me in a place where my parents, like, like y'all give me way more love than my parents ever could have given me, ever. I got aunties, uncles all up, all up through here. And a mama and a daddy. <laughs> Two daddies, actually. <laughs> you know, so it's like I understand that today, and I'm grateful that I started processing that grief, man, because it had me paralyzed. It had my spirit paralyzed. Um, I just met a, a young lady in the hallway that lost her father, man. Like, friend, like, get your healing, sis. I don't, I don't see you. I don't know where you at. Just get it. I know you in here somewhere. But needless to say, you know, when I got back, man. Like I said, I was angry, I was unapproachable, but I knew I needed to keep making meetings. And I remember being in front of Main Street Clubhouse and this man walked up to me. Well, he was talking to somebody else and then he walked up to me and he said, how much time you got? I said, not enough, like leave me alone. <laughs> Leave me alone, you know, because all the dudes was trying to proposition me and all the women was hating on me. That's what my mind tell me when I first got here. You know, so I said, not enough. He said, how long you been clean? I said, I got nine days. He said, good, I want you to be the speaker at the, uh, the midnight speaker at the 4th of July event. I was like, what? What you mean a speaker? Like I just told you I got nine days. He said, you've been clean before? I said, yeah. He said, well, you know what to do. All right. So I go to this commitment with not, uh, well, by the time the commitment rolled around, I had 17 days. And I'm talking about angry and unapproachable. I sat in my car from 6 p.m. to midnight because I did not know how to fellowship. You know, I did not know like it was a whole marathon speaker jam going on. I didn't, it just, I, I know this man told me to be there at midnight and I said I was gonna be there, so I'm gonna be there. And I sat in my car for six hours on Facebook or something. I don't know what I was doing. <laughs> and um, so I shared, I, I ended up sharing, right? And my, my real name is unique, right? And my sister's name is special. And when I shared, there were members that came up to me after the meeting was like, you chocolate daughter. It was me, it was members in those meetings that knew my parents. Cause you don't find a unique and a special. 
You might find a Keisha and a LaQuisha, but that ain't, you know what I'm saying? You, yeah, you, you, you know, you don't, you don't really hear that. You don't really hear that pair too much, right? So it was members in there that knew my parents. And, and I instantly had people watching over me from a, like with a, with a, a with a, a extra layer, you know what I'm saying? And it was, um, I recently just did an H&I commitment the other day. And I shared, I said, my name is Unique. And I shared, and I, you know, I talked about having a sister and stuff like that, but I didn't say her name. And a lady came up to me, she said, you chocolate girl. I'm talking about like, my mother's birthday was just two, three days ago. Um, but needless to say, I showed up for the commitment, did the commitment, and then here come this man calling me again. He said, are you going to the West End Convention? I said, no, nah, I don't think so. Because coming from prostitution, Ooh. coming from prostitution, I, I didn't understand the value of spending my money to stay in a hotel all weekend and make meetings. Like, I need to be making my money back. Like, <laughs> what you need to come to the convention? For what? I can make a meeting out here and don't spend nothing, you know? He was like, just come to the convention. You know, and I got there and he hands me this clipboard and he's like, I need you to sign these speakers in. I'm like, I don't know nobody. He says, that's the point. And he gives me this denim jacket with my clean date on it. And he threw my ass on the West End program. <laughs> I love you, Archie. <laughs> love you, Archie. So from there, like, I started really just getting involved in service, you know, like, I, 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 today I understand what it means to, like, get in the teacup and not hang out on the salsa. You know, we have a symbol. It's a circle with a square. Get in the square. What's the square? What's the square, y'all? Hold on, let me. Self, society, service, and God. I want to say it like it was in the book. I ain't want to, you know. Uh, but needless to say, like, I, I, today I understood what it means to, like, really get involved in this program. Like, if you ain't enjoying your process, you ain't doing something right. Granted, we all got life on life terms, but, like, I remember being new and just getting involved and really internalizing with, the, hey, Gigi, I ain't see you over here. Hey, Gigi. <laughs> My grand sponsor. Uh, it's fine, y'all see too funny. But um, yeah, like I, I didn't understand what this program, like what that power was. Like what's the, like what's the power behind service? You know, I didn't understand the power behind being of service, man. Like and then my predecessor from my home group, he was like, I need you to, to chair the meeting on Thursday night. It's 11.30 to one o'clock in the morning. We meet every night at the world famous Highland Club. And um, I chaired that meeting and it kept, it kept me, it, like I got to see what this thing was really about because it would be times that I would sit again in my car from the six o'clock meeting to the 11.30 and 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 I'll be in the parking lot like man ain't nobody why am I sitting here man ain't nobody fucking coming in here and then I added a show up in pain you know an addict that just used the addict that just lost someone an addict that just needed a place to go at 11 30 at night because that disease done caught up just got, got up on them and I got to see why we do service, man. Anybody that's in any service, thank you. Any service in our life. So I remember getting involved in service, man. And, 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 and now it is time to do some work because I'm still showing my ass, even though I'm and all involved in NA and got my NA ring and my NA earrings. I'm still showing my hands. 
Right. So um, I remember getting, a, I remember thinking like, who was the nicest lady to me when I first got clean? Like I was thinking about the last time I was clean and I found her and we lasted for about three days. We lasted about three days. It just, it just wasn't going to work. I was like, I ain't going to be able to get honest with her. You know, if you don't feel like you got the best sponsor in the world, you need you a new sponsor. If you can't tell your sponsor the whole truth and nothing but the truth, you need you a new sponsor. You know, I always say there are three things that are indispensable. That's honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. But there are one, there's one thing that is dispensable. And that's a sponsor. There's too many people around here with the knowledge of the 12 steps and the 12 traditions that's willing to help you in your recovery. You don't like that one, get you another one. You don't like that one, get you another one. They dispense it. Well, get you another one, get you another one. Until you find out what works for you because your recovery is your responsibility. You know, um, so I remember, you know, I went through that season. I've had about three sponsors since I've been clean this time. And, um, It was a journey. Everywhere that I went, though, I saw I saw my who my current sponsor is. Everywhere I went, I saw her. And when I asked her to be my sponsor, we just so happened to be on a boat in Tennessee. Oh man, I wasn't even gonna go to that. You know, it was like it's a convention. I'm like, where is that? They like it's it, it's at, it's a camp out. I'm like the fuck. <laughs> what you mean a camp out? In the middle of Tennessee somewhere. I'm like, I'm not going out there with the folks. It's just crazy. <laughs> like, what are we doing out here? It's like, we coming to carry the message. I'm like, all right, man. And, and, you know, I had a sponsor at the time we were doing, we were doing, you know, we were doing the work, but I wasn't able to connect spiritually with her. You know, uh, it was like, it was as if I was, um, like my ego would get the best of me when I was working with this sponsor because she hadn't really done anything. Like, so I'll be telling her, so she's like, girl, for real? Ooh, girl, what, girl? And I'll be like, yeah, girl. And she just really didn't have much experience with stuff, right? But then I hear this woman, like, I hear this woman talking about walking the streets till she had calluses on her feet and didn't even know what size shoe she wore. That's the sponsor I need. That's the sponsor I needed, right? So I would see Vanessa everywhere that I went and we were on this boat in Tennessee and she was looking out at the breeze. It was like Titanic. <laughs> she was connected to her higher power. And, she was and I was just like, will you be my sponsor? Say, yeah, baby. <laughs> I just burst. Oh! Oh, Lord, thank you, God, please, God, thank you so much, you know, and it has been a journey, it has been a lot of, man, it has, it's been so much going on in this process, but I'm real grateful that my sponsor now took me, she didn't even, like, my other sponsor took me straight to the steps, this sponsor here took me straight to the symbol, and from there, we went through the preface, we went through the introduction, and I would have learned a long time ago that we do not focus on a specific substance. We focus on the disease of addiction, right? And, and I didn't know, I didn't hear that for some reason when I came in and out all the time. Like I heard the disease, but I ain't got no disease. Y'all got the disease. I, I'm just here. I just do drugs. I don't know what y'all are talking about. You know, but for some reason I wasn't hearing that. But if I had read the book, Newcomer, read the literature, get a sponsor that's willing to help you understand this stuff. Because when I got to that introduction and, it, and it, I was like, oh, okay, like, Oh, alcohol is too limited of a term for us. Like it's that we fall exception. Our identification as addicts is all inclusive with the respect to any mood, mind, altering substance. Alcohol is too limited of a term. Weed is too limited of a term. Pills is too limited of a term. 
X is too limited of a term. Sex is a little bit of time. You hear me? Our problem is not a specific substance. It's the disease called addiction. I really wish I would have heard that a long time ago. Right. So, um, I didn't understand what the disease was. The disease is obsession and compulsion. It's my obsessive, my obsessive thoughts and the compulsion in my actions. I can't stop once I start. That's just what the disease is. Right? And it says, what is my disease? Obsession and compulsion and self-centeredness. Can't forget that little piece. Endless loops that lead nowhere but to spiritual, physical, and mental decay. Lead nowhere. Right? And I remember um, when I started really going through this step working process, like, like that was my first year of service. I got my jacket and shit. I'm, Yay, amen. You know, and that second year come around, and um, I remember um, programming committee, and. Our Wiener Commission is around Thanksgiving holidays. And the day before Thanksgiving, the girl that I was dating the last time I was clean was murdered the day before Thanksgiving. All right, and um, I remember being with my family on Thanksgiving day, and I got a call that a friend of mine was gunned down at the gas station on Thanksgiving day. But I couldn't really sit in none of that too long because of a service commitment that I wasn't even trying to commit to in the first place. Service is what saved me. You know, and I ended up showing up to the West End Convention. I had no choice. I had I was on programming. You know what I'm saying? I was on programming and I remember being at the convention having like a, a reality, like a moment of clarity, like this is what this means. Like they carried me through the weekend. I know some people in here that's doing service right now, that's, that's, that's got this Gretna going, that's going through something. You know, and this service piece is so instrumental because I, I just, I, I didn't really even know what to do with myself other than show up and just be your service. And so like that third year comes, boom. Everything, I'm happy, joyous and free now. I'm starting to do a little work. And um, my stepdad died. And for the first time in my three years, I actually felt like getting high. And I was so, I was paralyzed with fear. Like I felt like the disease, like I felt like drugs was just gonna walk down the street, come knock on my door and jump in my body. Like I was that paranoid. And I remember going to my Gigi's house before she was, I don't even know. Yeah, she was my, my Gigi then. And, um, and, and I went to her house and I sat there for three days. I was paranoid as fuck. I just, I just knew if I left her house, I was gonna get high. And I called my sponsor and we kept, she came over and we, we, damn, I think we was on step, step one or two then. And um, we did some step, well, first of all, I told my sponsor, I was like, man, I've been here three days, man. I ain't even washed, I ain't took no shower or nothing. She said, baby, go wash your ass. I'm gonna be over there in a minute. <laughs> I'm gonna be over there in a minute, go wash your ass. <laughs> You know, so we did a little work or whatnot. She left, you know, and, and I remember um, there was this basket of pills sitting on top of the refrigerator at, at my grand sponsor's house. And it was just me at the house and I took the basket down and my mind said, pills ain't my thing. I'm gonna 
I'm looking at them. I'm looking at them. I got my phone. I'm Googling shit. <laughs> Will this get me high? <laughs> Googling shit. And like, as soon, like, by the time I got to like the second bottle, Susan walked in the door. And I ran to her and I just fell into her arms. And I was, and I said, I was just about to puke. You said you wouldn't have got high anyway, them children tablets. <laughs> but see, but see, today I understand I probably, I would have lost my clean time because my intentions were to get high. If I drink a little too much Listerine, I'm trying to get high. You know, I, like, I, we know when we're trying to get high. I ain't even got to go down that road. When we're trying to fix a feeling with something. We know what that feel like. And um, so needless to say, I made it through my third year. Then the fourth year comes. The pandemic. I mean, we all struggled through the pandemic. I feel like you should get two years clean for 2020. <laughs> I'm just saying, you made it through the pandemic. We need, I feel like we need about a two, at least two or you know, two years on that one. Boy, that was a rough year. You hear me? June 10th, I lost my job at the Macy's of Recovery. Some of y'all work in the recovery field. Y'all know who I'm talking about. Uh, I lost my job. Uh, no, 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 you know, it was all my fault. But at that time, you couldn't have told me that shit. I was like, if I was a white woman and I sent that email, they wouldn't have did me like that. And nah, 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 nah. you know, I just was all over the place, you know. Um, not, not, not really looking at how many times they tried to support me. You know, they done put me on the EAP. They done gave me all kind of assistance. The psychiatrist at the job done try to talk to. I was just going through it. It was time to go. <laughs> you know, so I lost my job June 10th. June 14th, I was diagnosed with COVID. And June 15th is my clean day. And I didn't use. And at that time when, when people were getting COVID, we didn't know what was gonna happen. But I knew, I had seen many members die clean. And I knew using was not the option. And when I put that post on social media that I had COVID because we was just at my, my clean day is actually my grand sponsor's birthday and she had a party. So I was around a lot of people and um, I, I put it out there that I had COVID. And when I tell you, I had I, some people was bringing me shit. I ain't even know how to cook. I'm like, what the fuck am I supposed to do with this? They was, I, I mean, I got me a, they got me a hotel room for two weeks because I live with my grandmother. You know, I take care of my grandmother who has COPD, you know? So like, I'm talking about, I never even made it home once I got the diagnosis. Like Narcotics Anonymous showed up for me once again. People sent me money. They came and dropped out baskets of food. I had all kind of vitamin A, B, C, D, E, M, G, A. I'm talking about them folks made sure I was good. Somebody brought me coloring books. One of my homegirls brought me some weed so I could braid my hair while I was sitting in there because I didn't have shit else to do. You know, like people looked out for me while I was in, in, in that situation. You know, but the th one thing I did not do, I didn't do no work while I was in that. So when I got out of that, thought I was invincible. I thought my immune system did this. I, you know, I, my, my immune system is the reason I survived, not God. So I like to tell you, unfortunately in 2020, I lost 17 of my friends. 17, and they weren't all from COVID. We lost some good people in 2020, man. You know, there was uh, one specific predecessor. Nick J, he used to always try to tell me what to do. Oh, <laughs> well, we used to be out there arguing all morning. 
He said, how old are you? Well, so what you need is you need your brother that ain't no more than about this old, that he need to be able to carry both of y'all babies like this. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Oh, he was confrontational. He'll tell you real quick, cigarettes is a drug. Then you walk outside and smoke 10 cigarettes like it's gonna hurt, hurt him or something. But yeah, man, we lost some good people in 2020, man. And um, I, my disease manifested itself in another area. Come on, man. Yeah. yeah. And um, I ain't finna do nothing but tell the whole truth because it's mine. And it might make some people uncomfortable. I'm gonna tell you what they told me, go call your goddamn sponsor. <laughs> right, so in 2020, um, I started wilding out, man. I got introduced to this, uh, this, this community where you can just have a whole lot of sex. If you know, you know. And um, I was strung out without the use of drugs. I started abusing myself. I'm not even looking at the abuse I'm causing myself. I'm using people, places, and things again without the use of, the use of drugs. Um, and, that's, and that went on for about two years. You know, and I was completely okay um, because I let, the, I let the disease trick me. Like I said, them just pills. I let the disease trick me into, well, you're not selling your body anymore. You know, you can have sex with whoever you want. You're single. And I'm not looking at how I'm using people to fix something in me that they cannot fix. So I constantly pile shit on top of shit, 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 on top of shit. They just kept going. Like it just, it just got out of control, you know, and Eventually, um, I didn't like how I felt anymore. You know, it's, 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 it was a predecessor that said something to me. Um, it was one, like I, would, I remember listening to a Zoom meeting and these women were on there, you know, breaking down about how they were falling apart in these unhealthy relationships and all of this stuff. And you know me, I'm like, See, that's why I ain't in no relationship. I'm good. I just do me and wipe off and go home, you know. Right? So I was talking to this predecessor who was operating in the same spirit, right? And he says, mm, ain't it funny how the person, how a person is feeling something and we're sitting there with no feelings. Like we don't feel anything when we do this stuff. And I was like, damn, why are you about to get all deep and spiritual? <laughs> but he was right. Like how I'm gonna sit there and judge somebody for feeling and I don't feel shit. I got a deeper hole to get out of. You know, um, so needless to say, you know, my fifth year went pretty good. Sixth year went pretty good. It's something about that seven though. And I, and I remember like, I started really like, you know, at first, the first couple steps is just trying to develop your relationship with your higher power, right? Like just trying to have some hope, some faith, you know, but then you start getting down to this, to this, uh, searching and fearless and moral inventory, <laughs> right? So I started having to really, really like start addressing some things, right? I had to really start looking at some stuff, right? And I remember having this, um, there you go, Miss Alva. There you go, right down the front. Thank you for coming to see me, I love you. <laughs> um, but so I'm looking at this, I'm looking at, this like like these resentments. So that's what really happened, newcomer. I started on the fourth step right before the pandemic and I stopped. So I had pulled up all of this stuff. And then it, like, like if you don't hear nothing else I say, when you start writing on that fourth step, keep going. Cause it's some freedom at the end, right? I mean, I remember saying I would rather count a gallon of rice one by one than write this fourth step. But that was the worst thing I did was start that step and stop. 
right? And I remember having all these resentments on here, you know, and, and the first people I put on my list was my parents. They left me. If my daddy would have told me this, I wouldn't be doing this. And if my mama wouldn't have told me that, I wouldn't have been. And my sponsor looked at me and said, none of that is true, baby. I threw the step work the hell up tonight. You know, I threw my step work guy at her. <laughs> I threw it at her. I'm like, what you mean? Like, I, I have to have someone to blame. I know that was loud right there. <laughs> I'm going to try to, I'm gonna try to keep it a little low. I'm going to try not to get too passionate. I see Mr. Sanchez right there. Uh, I'm going to try not to get too passionate, boy, because I get real loud. Um, but yeah, I needed someone to blame. And, and what that fourth step did was help me to see my part in some things. Like I could no longer blame my mother and father for how I, were, how I was treating myself today. My mother died when I was 14. You know, my dad died a couple of years ago. Like I could no longer blame them for the way I was acting right now. But I was, I, I want like, when I started my resentment list, I was like, oh yeah, I get to write about the person who did this, 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 and this, and this. And the reality was is I caused most of that. But it was some freedom in knowing that I did it so I don't have to do it again. And on the other side of all of that stuff was so I got to learn about my assets. I got to learn some beautiful things about you need. You know, and it was a lot of freedom in that. Like I'm not this bad person. Like anything that I don't like about myself, all I have to do is stop. Oh, but we get to that fifth step. I mean, that sixth step. But by then I'm caught up in the grips of that lifestyle I was telling y'all about. And I'm going to predecessors talking about how do you surrender to something you don't want to stop? And then when the pain our way to pleasure, you will. I'm like, shit, my sex be good. I don't know what y'all talking It's going to be a long time before I surrender. I be having a ball. I be having fun, boy. Be having a lot of fun. Like, what you mean? Like, you ain't been to the places that I've been. You, but anything you see on the internet, I have seen in real life, in real time. You know, and I was strung out, for real. You know, so I'm looking at this de character defect of lust. And then, I, and then I go back to my fourth step and I'm seeing all these situations of people that I resented to and how they connected to my lust. Had I not been hot in the ass, I wouldn't have been in a lot of them situations. You know, had I not been caught up in greed, I wouldn't have been caught up in a lot of those situations. Had I not been so self-obsessed with what I want, I wouldn't have been caught up in a lot of those situations. You know, and I'm real grateful to know that it was it was my fault. It's 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 it's, it's ironic to say that, <laughs> but that's the freedom of this program, man. And um, you know, so once I once I process that six step, I remember uh, getting in a space where I just needed to. Um, I just needed. I I just. I remember calling, um, I remember calling this predecessor. I said, how do I go to a state that I've never been before? Like, how do I get to a state where like, I don't have sex? I ain't never been there before. Like, I don't know. I lost my virginity at 12 years old to a man that I didn't even know in a park because I was insecure and just wanted to do what everybody else was doing. How do I go back to a state? Like, what state? She said, unique. Well, <clears throat> you need to look at what you know about sex. How was sex taught to you? You know, and, and I never knew about the birds and the bees and the... <laughs> The birds that turn to bees and the bees that turn to y'all you know. <laughs> get what I'm trying to say. You know, and I said, well, I said, well, is it that I don't value my vagina? He said, it's not that you don't value your vagina. Vagina just has no value where you come from. I'm talking about, I'm talking about that right there. 
changed my life. You got some value, girl. <laughs> and I sat on it. Sit on it. I remember my predecessor used to say, just sit on it, baby. Just sit. I'm like, I am. I know. That ain't what she meant. <laughs> that ain't what she meant, you need. <laughs> that is not what that lady meant. That is not what that lady meant. At all. That is not what that lady meant. You know, um, and I sat on it. And for a year, God placed this man in my life who I had no intentions on being. Oh, yeah. He snuck up on me. Like what they say, uh, what, what is that joke that be telling to me all the time? How do you catch a unique rabbit? You unique up on it. That's what he did. That's what he did. He uniqued up on me, you know. But he was my friend through that process when I was uh, my process of abstinence, you know. Um, and, and he waited for me. He waited for me. Like he just wanted my company. And I had never had that before. I didn't even realize he even liked me anymore because I told him no, like when we first started talking. And he just was my friend, you know, and, and he waited for me. Um, and he creates space for me, man. It's so, it's, it's, it's awesome, man. You know, but um, needless to say, like, since I've been here, newcomer, man, like you got to become aware of what the symptoms of your disease is, right? And the symptoms of your disease are on page 20. I'm going to give it to you. You know, some people be like, just read it. Now, I'm going to tell you exactly where it's at. So you ain't got to be looking for it. And uh, you're welcome. I got you're welcome. So here at the bottom, the symptoms of your disease are denial, substitution, rationalization, justification, distrust of others, Guilt, embarrassment, dereliction, degradation, isolation, and loss of control are all results of your disease. We call them the 11 thugs, where I'm from. <laughs> right? Because I could be caught up in denial with clean time. Right? One of my predecessors said, we'll be, so, we'll be overdosing on hope that we'll be in denial. And they said denial mixed with hope creates a speedball of illusion. Right, and I could substitute some shit, right? It could be, I done gained a hundred pounds since I've been here. I got every shoe on the internet just about. I done bought every fedora, you know, my style of change. I be wearing hats one time, I got head wraps. You get these at Michael's though. But they like, you <laughs> buy, the, buy the fabric at Michael's for $5. I'm not paying $20 for a head wrap. Anyway, um, yeah, you can substitute one for another. You know, how you, like the disease, it wants what feels good, smell good, look good, taste good. And you'll be caught up without the use of drugs, right? And you will justify and rationalize your behavior because you're not using drugs. Sweetheart, drugs is the most obvious thing. Right? So you could get caught up in any of these behaviors clean. You know, we seeing a lot of members go out with clean time, right? And I, and I just want to make this statement. This is just for me, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you came here before me and you lost your clean time, you are still my predecessor. Because the word predecessor just means to come before, right? One come before two. One is the predecessor of two. Two is the successor. It's all that. So I respect my predecessors. Whether you came or you, I, don't, I don't really care, man. Um, but I'm gonna read this real quick. It says, um, let me read this real quick. This is in the, um, in the seventh step. It says, in time, we'll find that God has worked in our lives. We may have been startled by the level of maturity or spirituality we've demonstrated. Y'all see me up here. I'm talking about I done came a long way for y'all motherfuckers thinking that we can't come up. Oh, real quick, I remember the first time I was I was told about Gretna, you know, the region 
the young lady, we were riding in the car. It was, uh, you know, me and then my, my, my the black guy friend and then he, my two white friends up front. The white girl from uh, Marietta, the uh, other white dude is from uh, Gwinnett and I'm from uh, Magna, and my other friend was from the West End. And she's in there like, we need to go to Gretna and show them what this is about. <laughs> you see this car, this is what Narcotics Anonymous should represent. I said, girl, I'm not going up there with them folks. <laughs> well, I'm talking about that. <laughs> God got a way of doing something for you, don't <laughs> Because I meant to say that in Addy, any Addy. I hadn't heard the message yet. I hadn't heard the message yet. But let me read this real quick before I get up out of here. It says, in time, we'll find that God has worked in our lives. We may even be startled by the level of maturity or spirituality we've demonstrated in handling situation in years past will have had us acting very unspiritually. One day, we'll realize that some of the ways we used to act have become as alien as spiritual principles were when we first started practicing them. After such a revelation, we may begin thinking about the person we were when we first came to NA and how little we resemble that person now. Thank y'all. Give it up one more time for you, Lee. She's one of my favorite people in the whole wide world right there. All right, guys. So let's go ahead and circle up and uh, close in our normal fashion.